Hello. Our next speaker is an engineer at Gallon Engine who studied electrical engineering and then completed a PhD working on helicopter-based radar. This talk explains their solution allows for a viable realization of rotary vane engine and how the architecture of the engine makes it ideally suited to producing electrical power from hydrocarbons. Please welcome to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Natalia Gallen. Good luck. Hello world. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, the, the title of which is Software is Eating the Internal Combustion Engine. Um, and I'd like to, uh, I guess, give some context as to why I've called it this, um, in case it wasn't um, apparent. So back, back in 2011, Mark Adriesen, who's a super successful and smart VC, observed really astutely that he wrote a blog post called Soft Why Software is Eating the World, in which he observed the fact that many frictions in society were being replaced by software systems. Consider, for example, um, going to a bank. Uh, previously, if you were to withdraw money, you would see a person physically, you'd go to a teller or so forth. Nowadays, um, that is basically everything's online and has an, software has enabled banks that don't even have a physical presence. Um, so that's just basically the trend that he observed occurring. And I'd like to explain how this trend has kind of entered the world of the internal combustion engine. Okay, cool. So the aim of my talk um, is, firstly, I'll just ask a question. Who knows what Gallon Engine is? Yeah, cool. <laughs> I can hear crickets. <laughs> no one. That's great. Um, that's why you're here. Um, so the basic aim, aside from and explaining my title, is what is Gallon Engine? Uh, describe uh, how it works, what it can do, riff about certain applications, what it's useful for, where it's not useful for. So you can leave this arena knowing uh, a little bit about it. And also, join me in building it, because I think it's exciting. I think this is a really great time uh, for a new type of uh, internal combustion engine to come onto the scene. OK, so let's talk about what I'm going to talk about. Firstly, who am I? So uh, just a brief description of who is standing here uh, talking. Uh, some background on engine development in general, like what has the world since you know the mid-1800s seen. Um, in that world, uh, rotary vane engine, a description of how those things work, how they're different from the engines that I think you're most familiar with, which is the reciprocating piston engine, what gallon engine is specifically, uh, the anatomy of it, uh, what can it do, what can't it do, where are we at present in the development cycle, uh, and why now, which is really important, um, why the timing is so much, uh, so it's such a big deal um, in all kinds of innovations and inventions, right? And then, you know, a massive shout out to thanks because I've met so many brilliant people who've helped me um, the journey so far. Okay, so who am I? Briefly, you've already heard. I have a degree in electrical engineering. I have a PhD in radar. Um, I worked at NASA as a Fulbright Scholar. It was a really uh, interesting time there. Um, and then I did some postdocs at UCL um, in the cryospheric um, satellite um, group. I did some firmware um, development. And I'm like, you could look at this up on LinkedIn, and then I had a data analytics consultancy, and I do research papers and patents. Okay, so uh, that's my professional life um, in a nutshell. Okay, so brief history, like what's the context? So what I'm going to do is like, by analogy, I'm going to be talking to you about a nematode that we have invented at Gallon Engine. <laughs> but before I tell you how cool this nematode is, I have to give you some understanding of the world, like the tree of life. Where does this nematode fit in to the, you know, the context and the framework? And basically, you know, since the mid-1800s, we've been uh, talking about things such as heat engines. And heat engines are basically machines that exploit temperature gradients for, uh, um, and produce useful work by exploiting a temperature gradient. Um, and those split out into uh, two variants. Um, the external combustion, such as the steam engine or the Stirling engine, where the uh, source of heat is external to the engine system. Internal combustion, which I think you're most familiar with because it's most cars, unless you're lucky enough to have an electrical vehicle, uh, lawn mowers, whippersnippers, so forth, right? Internal combustion um, engines are there. And then we're talking about the kind of uh, 
the kind of motion that the piston goes through. And wherever you see dots on the graph, it means there are many, many more alternatives. Because uh, this, uh, this field is rich in uh, ingenious inventions. And I'll touch on that in my next slide. Uh, so then from the internal combustion under that, we have reciprocating, which you're familiar with, um, and the rotary. So the gallon engine is a type of rotary engine. And then the rotary engine under there, we have, for example, a turbine, a piston, where the piston rotates. And I think you're familiar with types of uh, rotating piston engines in the Mazda RX. So that's the Wankel engine, for example. Or liquid piston. They're a great company uh, making engines. Look them up. Um, really interesting uh, development there or the rotary vane engine. So a gallon engine is a rotary vane engine, and we'll go into specifically how that um, operates. So that's just to give you some very high level view. I haven't included a lot of the leaves in the tree, but you can see where we fit into the kind of the schema of um, engine architecture. And this is, I love looking at this guy's website. Douglas Self curates a museum of unusual engines. It, so uh, you can check out his engine, um, sorry, website down there. I encourage you to do so. It's mind-opening because there are so many. So the, this tree that I drew up very coarsely here is actually rich in inventiveness. Um, but it's interesting to remark that the only thing that we've currently so, no, the only thing that we currently have is kind of the reciprocating piston engine, an Evenkel engine, um, and. The, they differentiate themselves by uh, the, op, like the position of the piston. Is it in line? Is it a V? Is it a W? Is it radial? Is it a post cylinder? Anyway, so I'll come back to, to why that is and why it's important. Okay, so briefly, how does the rotary vane engine work in comparison to a reciprocating piston? So I have here, you know, the familiar, I think, and for those of you who aren't familiar, they're the four strokes of the um, operation of an engine. We'll go with a four stroke one, not a two stroke one, the easier. So we have the full strokes, which is intake, compression, power, where um, they, um, expand, um, the explosion occurs and heat is uh, put into the system, and then the exhaust. So let's take a look. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. They, they both play. Okay. So you can see here, so at the top, we're looking at the reciprocating piston. So single cylinder piston engine going through the full strokes. and. One thing I'd like you to observe, so the rotary motion is coming out of that crankshaft, so crankshaft sticking out towards the screen, towards you guys, and it has one power stroke every two revolutions of the crankshaft. This is a single cylinder rotary vane engine, and it's, as it's rotating, the little ball goes through the, um, it's just labeled here going through the four strokes, but there are four power strokes per revolution. So that's an interesting um, differentiation. Okay, so rotary vane engines have been chased after, and there's been lots of development in this field, basically since the advent of uh, heat engines. And they're really interesting, um, as you can imagine, I think appreciate, just from that comparison between um, a single cylinder uh, reciprocating piston and a single cylinder rotary vane, is that it's a much simpler design. You didn't, there are no camshafts, there are no valves, there's no crankshaft. Um, it's more, it's balanced. Um, if you ever, you know, seen a single cylinder uh, piston engine on your table, that thing will just fall off vibrating. There's lots of vibration in that thing, whereas a gallon engine, it, oh, sorry, gallon, a rotary vane engine is much more balanced. Uh, fewer vibrations, more be quiet in its operation. Um, and also, this is a graph uh, demonstrating, so I tried to, so this is a MATLAB code also referenced down the bottom, comparing a single cylinder, kind of similarly sized rotary vane uh, combustion cycle to the combustion process in a single cylinder piston engine. And you can see that the average torque, which is the dotted dashed line, um, I think you can still hear me over those guys, um, is actually higher in the rotary vane, and the combustion time is, all things being equal, a bit faster. So it could be more efficient, all things being equal. Now the disadvantages are there, it is new, it is different. No one's ever built one before, except for one guy called Andrew Deck, and if you're there, how do I stare into a camera? Where's the camera? Yeah, Andrew Deck, if you're out there, please respond to my LinkedIn message. <laughs> and if you guys know him, Please <laughs> reach out. Is it, like, watch this video, it's amazing. This guy has made a rotary vane engine. 
Um, and so I'd love to talk to him, right? love to work together. But there are possible ceiling problems before anyone says that ceiling is a problem. There might be co possible cooling problems, but those would be really great things to solve. But I think fundamentally why this thing, why this like awesome architecture hasn't actually made it, and when I say made it, I mean made it to market. Um, you can't buy it. So I, I um, yeah, is because when so we, I forgot to mention this. Yeah. You need to basically have gearing mechanisms to create that motion that you see there. So previously, those, um, that rotation was facilitated by mechanical gears. So the patent world is filled with people's applications for various types of gearing mechanisms to facilitate that kind of slow, uh, that, that requisite motion of the two veins to go through the four um, strokes of operation. And I suspect, this is my thesis, is that because of those mechanical gears, all iterations of this engine have failed because they could not withstand the combustion, um, the torsional forces due to combustion. So enter the Gallon engine. The Gallon engine is a rotary vane engine in which the mechanical linkages, so this gearing mechanism, is re replaced with reversible electrical machines. So that's the key here. We replace a highly frictional component with just use it by, with electrical machines directly onto the shaft to facilitate the requisite motion of the veins. And here's just a slow video. I should have sped, sped that up. So through the electrical machines, we're directly converting the heat energy generated by the combustion of a fuel into electrical energy. So this is why, this is where, at, at which point I can say, or I'm trying to say that software is eating the world of the internal combustion engine because we've re um, replaced the mechanical complexity with software complexity. Now, what I think it cannot do is it cannot be a prime mover. I don't think it's going to be successfully competing with an internal, like a reciprocating piston, internal combustion engine for a vehicle. What gallon engine, through the coupling of electrical machines to the shafts, is precisely poised to do is to convert chemical energy from hydrocarbons, and I'm being very general because I think we can um, develop these for all sorts of fuels that are combustible, um, into electrical energy. Now the cool thing is, um, and we like cool things here, is uh, you, know, you can have over the air updates to your uh, engine, because you can update the software. Um, uh, and you know, because it, it's all, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all driven by software, so it's going to be free and easy, right, software engineers? <laughs> and, so, and most importantly, you'll be able to ship bug fixes. <laughs> um, I suspect we'll be able to, because we have a software-controlled crankshaft, change the compression ratio um, with software updates, um, and thereby support different types of fuels, and also exotic types of um, combustion techniques that are currently being explored, such as um, homogeneous charge compression ignition. Look into it, it's kind of cool. Um, and I suspect Gallon Engine will kind of be able to do this um, out of the box. So where are we at present? So currently, I have um, been very fortunate to engage a team of wonderful final year mechanical mechatronic enge uh, engineers at the University of New South Wales, who've built a simulation model of the gallon engine. Nope, don't worry about that one. Yeah. Oh no, they both run at the same time. Okay, so just pay attention to that. Hopefully you'll appreciate that sound later. Um, yeah, so basically this is, um, it's uh, two stepper motors driven, um, uh, driven by an ESP32, a dual core system, one core is responsible for directing the stepper motors, the other core is um, 
doing the LED lighting to you know, illuminate the four strokes and also um, talking to a custom web server that they've built. And I really like this slide, which basically shows when each motor is generating, when it's motoring, and how much um, power is accumulated into the battery over time. And then in parallel to that process, um, I've been working on a compressed gas driven prototype. So currently, we're as far as completing So the chamber has been built, and that really nice sound you heard. Yeah, that, so this is me just using my hands to operate the, the veins inside the chamber. But that squelchy noise is basically demonstrating, I hope, to all of you that it's keeping pressure. So it's really exciting. And hopefully, with you know another couple of weeks, a month, we'll be able to actuate this with electrical machines and demonstrate um, extraction of uh, work from compressed gas. Next steps is to build a um, generator. Okay, so that's where we are. And why now? So this is really important, I think, to always come, like, to first set up the framework, why we're here, but also why now's a good time. And I think now is a really interesting time because Gallon Engine allows us to do something that we couldn't do before. So yeah, I admit, at this stage, like when I develop a prototype, it's gonna suck, like it's gonna be bad, right? It's not, gonna, like we're gonna be producing a bit of energy, like it's gonna show the principle of operation fairly, but it ain't gonna be 10 times better than what's on the market now. That's not the point, because back when, um, you know, heat engines were first being built and designed, the first steam engine. The efficiency of those engines was in fact comparable to the efficiency of draft horses that they were replacing. Um, Vaclav Smil's amazing book called Prime Movers discusses this, so you can look this up if you don't believe me. Um, so, so it was like 900 grams per watt was the power density. And the engines, when they first came on the market, had exactly the same efficiency. So there's nothing, there was like no 10 times better but the difference was that those engines could do something that draft horses couldn't. They could operate you know, to around the clock with an operator who could fix them every now and again. But nevertheless, or operate in environments that draft horses couldn't operate in. So they did something other. And I think the same applies for gallon engine. It can do something other. So all this, so going back to Douglas's self-amazing curation of engines, all those engines are amazingly inventive architectures of how to convert um, chemical energy into useful work. But the question is, could they do something other? And in this case, I think we can answer yes. And it remains to be seen, but I, you know, work in progress, watch this space. Um, and yeah, so I, um, I'd like you, I'd like you to reach out to you and say, you know, join the revolution. <laughs> um, reach out to me. Um, yeah, if you can help, because uh, it's exciting. And it would be amazing to see one of these things, um, you know, in the flesh. Um, and thank you to everybody so far whose logos I've put here, who's helped me. And thank you to you for listening. <laughs>